This is going to be episode number eight of God's Game of Thrones. So far, we've looked at Lucifer. We looked at the cherubim, the seraphim, all the angels, all of the beings that would have been here before man. And now we're going to get into the human side of the Lord's creation. Now the Lord makes the next move, and he knocks Satan completely off the board game. He recreates the earth. He brings up a new king. And this king's name is Adam. Adam is told to replenish the earth. He replenishes it because something was inhabiting it before. This teaching has nothing to do with evolution. It has nothing to do with a pre-Adamic human race or billions of years. This has to do with God Appointing Lucifer as king over the kingdom of heaven, he fell, and God appointed a new king, King Adam. All the evolution, pre-Adamic human races, and trying to find a place to put billions of years of time is something naysayers will use to slander people who believe in a gap. But the average Bible-believing gapper doesn't even teach those things. All we're teaching is that there was a time when Lucifer reigned as king, as a perfect being, before he sinned and fell. But now let's look at the creation of King Adam. Genesis 1, 26 and 27. And God said, Let us make a man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. It is significant that Adam is made in the image of God. He is created sinless, and this makes him a son of God, as it calls him in Luke 3.38. So since he is in the image of God, he was made in the kingdom of God. He was made into it. Not only this, but he also holds the throne to the kingdom of heaven. In Genesis 1.26, when God makes Adam in his likeness, that is the physical aspect, and that's when he's made into the kingdom of heaven. Adam was born into both kingdoms, or made into both kingdoms. Uh, he was born made with a silver spoon in his mouth. He never had to be a baby. The Lord just created him as an adult. And many people are born into rich families. Adam was born, or I guess a better word would be made, into being a king over both kingdoms. He was made from the moment he was created into the family of God. When you get born again, you are born into the family of God. That's what happens when you get saved because you weren't born in the image of God. You had sin in you. So you had to get born again to be made in the image of God and put into the family of God. But Adam was different. He was created sinless first. But in Genesis 2, 21 through 23, it says, And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept, and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman, and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. So notice Adam was put into a deep sleep, picturing death, and the Lord God formed the woman out of Adam's rib. And you can see the topology. Jesus Christ died to get his bride, just like Adam was laid down, put into a deep sleep to get his bride. Jesus Christ was also cut in the side, just like Adam was cut in the side. For example, in John 19, through 34, it says, When they came to Jesus and saw that he was, al he was dead already, they broke not his legs, but one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side, and forthwith came there out blood and water. So Adam being put to sleep and the Lord cutting his side to get his rib is a picture of Jesus dying to get the bride of Christ and also being cut in his side. The Bible is a picture book. 
Every story is a picture of something. Now, Genesis 128. And God blessed them. And God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. Can you imagine the former king of both kingdoms, Lucifer, walking to and fro throughout the earth and hearing him tell these humans to have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. I'm sure he was pretty jealous. Notice Adam is told to replenish the earth. He has to replenish it because it had been inhabited before. It was emptied through a catastrophe. The command to replenish the earth is something that crosses into other dispensations, and this is why you can't limit dispensations to a period of time. But this command to replenish is something that will go on out into eternity, where children will still be born to men who will have natural bodies. God is going to go back to this original plan. And the original plan was for Adam and Eve to replenish the earth until the population goes out even into the universe. It would be a sinless uh, population but in revelation twenty two fourteen, it said blessed are they that do his commandments that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city that would be those people luke 1 and he shall reign over the house of jacob forever and of his kingdom there shall be no end that's the lord's kingdom that's coming in the future and you see it prophesied about over and over and over. Uh, Isaiah 9-7. Of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. Once again, just like in Luke 1 33, you see there's no end to it. It just keeps going on and getting bigger and bigger. Upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. So in eternity, his government will see no end. It will get bigger and bigger. People will continue to be born because there will still be some people in natural bodies. And that was his original plan with Adam and Eve. And when I say that, I'm not meaning that God didn't know Adam and Eve would sin. I'm not meaning that God is the one who failed or that God didn't know they would fail. Man failed. God gives them a choice. So Adam has dominion over this recreated earth and everything in it. That is, until his throne is threatened by the former king of both kingdoms. He has everything he could think about wanting. He has perfect health. He can run faster, run longer, jump higher, and do things that man today just can't even do. He lives to be over 900 years old. So obviously he was made different and in a completely different environment. Eve didn't have to worry about putting on makeup or getting her hair done or putting on nail polish or putting a filter on her selfies. I mean, she already looked good. She didn't have to put no filter on her selfies. Adam and Eve would have been flawless. Eve would have had painless childbirth. And we can speculate about what they might have looked like. But if you turn to Genesis chapter 2, it shows you when the Lord formed Adam. In Genesis 2, 7 through 12, And the Lord God formed man out of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living soul. And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden. And there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And a river went out of Eden to water the garden, and from thence it was parted and became into four heads. The name of the first is Pison, that is it which compasseth the whole land of Havilah, where there is gold, and the gold of that land is good. So in the middle of all this, out of nowhere, you have the Bible talking about a place of gold. Some believe Adam was made out of gold dust. It went from 
saying the Lord God formed man out of the dust of the ground to talking about a land of gold. The gold could have been left over from the previous world. You think this is far-fetched, but Lucifer, also created by God, Lucifer himself was made up of precious stones. As it says in Ezekiel 28, one of them was the onyx stone, which is also mentioned in verse 12 in Genesis chapter 2. So it's very possible that he was formed out of the dust that, when he was formed out of the dust of the ground could have been a little bit of gold dust and Adam would have been had a gold glorified body. And some people teach that that's what our glorified bodies will look like. We'll resemble that a golden glorified body. But I'm not saying that as an absolute doctrinal fact, just something to think about. But Adam is a king. Gold is associated with a king in the Bible. So this is speculation. But Adam's body could have been like the glorified body we will get at the rapture. At the rapture we will put on incorruptible bodies. It is obvious that Adam's body changed from a corruptible body to an incorruptible body after the fall, at least. If he had, you know, if it was just made like our glorified body is. But Adam is not told to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved, as we are told today, because he was made in the image of God. He is given one command, and that one command is not to eat off of a tree. Today, we aren't given the command to not eat off of a tree. It's true that God doesn't change. Nobody, I mean, I don't know anybody that thinks God changes, but what he says to man can change. As long as Adam doesn't eat off of this certain tree, then he's going to stay alive. In Genesis 2, 16 and 17, it says, And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. If Adam never ate off the tree of knowledge of good and evil, then he would have ate off the tree of life. And he would have lived forever. Genesis 3.22 And the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become as one of us, to know good and evil. And now, lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. And you know, the Lord puts cherubims there to guard the way of the tree of life so that man can't get in there and live forever in their sinful state. You'll also see when you read the end of Revelation that things go back around in a circle. You will see men eating off of a tree to get eternal life. This is completely different than how things are today. We get our eternal life through the Lord Jesus Christ. So the determining factor in Adam's eternal life at that time was whether or not he would eat off of a forbidden tree. And that's the first covenant, which many refer to it as the Edenic covenant. The Edenic covenant. He was to abstain from eating off the tree. Adam and Eve were both innocent. And this is why many refer to this as the dispensation of innocence. So our eternal life today is not conditioned on anything. That's a huge difference. There is no sin that's out there that the Lord says, if you do this, then you're not saved or you lose eternal life. There's nothing like that. There's no tree out there I can go eat off of and I'll lose my salvation or lose my eternal life or be kicked out of the family of God or lose the image of God. There's no sin like that today. Adam and Eve could have eaten off any tree except for that one tree. Notice that all the trees are said to be pleasant to the sight, not just the tree of knowledge of good and evil. But that one had a little bit more of appeal to it because that's the one they were told not to eat off of. But the Bible has a lot to say about trees, and they all represent something. For example, the olive tree, I believe, would be the, the tree of life. The fig tree represents self-righteousness. The vine tree, I believe that's the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Uh, because the only forbidden fruit in the Bible is a grape and that's on the vine tree as it talks about in number six 
you have a bramble tree that's you know, cursed, and that's where you get a crown of thorns. You have a chestnut tree, which represents strength, a cedar tree, and you got, and that represents like in First uh, Kings five six. If you look at First Kings five six. It says, Now therefore command thou that they hew me cedar trees out of Lebanon, and my servants shall be with thy servants. And unto thee will I give hire for thy servants according to all that thou shalt appoint. For thou knowest there is not among us any that can skill to hew timber like unto the Sidonians. And this is when preparations for building the temple. When Solomon is building that temple, the house of God. So the cedar tree... That's the house of God. And then you have the fir tree, the fruitfulness of the saints, is what that could represent. So there's a lot to say about tr different kinds of trees in the Bible. And the devil can see what the way of the eternal life is under the Edenic covenant. He knows that Adam and Eve need to keep their hands off that one tree. So Satan makes his move and tempts Eve in the garden. She eats the fruit. Her husband eats it with her. And Adam loses the image of God. He lost both kingdoms that day. The devil's, the devil's next move will be to destroy the next king. And then the next king after that. And then the next king after that. So the devil moves this human king out of the way and says, King me. He went from being a king of both kingdoms to having to work for food. Adam went from having perfect health to having physical pain and fatigue. So Adam had it all. He was made with it all. The moment the Lord breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, he woke up into a paradise with the world at his fingers. But he lost both kingdoms because he was deceived. Well, actually, Eve was deceived. And Adam loved his wife that was deceived more than he loved God. And that's how we're in the mess that we're in now. Genesis 3, 1 through 5 says, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field, which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, You shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die, for God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. So the serpent that's that former king of both kingdoms. That's Lucifer. And he's so jealous of Adam and Eve that he comes up with a plan to knock them off the throne. He wants to be the big dog in God's game of thrones. He wants to be the God in this game. So notice the serpent, the former king. Lucifer is trying to get his throne back. He tells her, ye shall be as gods, little g. That shows that Adam and Eve could see the spiritual realm. They could see the sons of God. Eve knew who the gods were. Genesis 3, 6 through 8 says, And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, then it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise. She took of the fruit thereof and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. Notice all of its positive. It's pleasant to the eyes, a tree to be desired, to make one wise. Just like they promote alcohol. It's pleasant to the side, it looks tasty. People desire it, and supposedly has benefits to it. There really isn't any benefits to it. 
And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden of the cool of the day. In the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. Notice, they heard the voice of the Lord God walking. They heard his voice walking. That's his word. That is a pre-incarnate appearance of the Lord Jesus. Uh, Genesis 3.19, In the sweat of thy face thou shalt eat bread till thou return unto the ground. For out of it wast thou taken. For dust thou art, and unto dust thou shalt return. That's what the Lord says to Adam because he ate the fruit. I mean, that's it's taken away his crown. Satan is once again back in control. By the Lord's allowance, that is. And now he has the power of death. Hebrews 2.14 For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is, the devil. So if you continue in sin, if you continued in sin and messed around with the devil, the quicker you return to the dust. He had the power of death. And you can be turned over to him for the destruction of the flesh. Now, when the Lord died on the cross, he destroyed him that had the power of death. Now, he's still around, but he's not got as much control as he did. But you could still be turned over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, just like the guy in 1 Corinthians 5. The, still, the Lord is still using the devil as a puppet, as his rod to chasten people and bring judgment on people. But he's just a puppet. After Adam and Eve sinned, this brought another covenant between God and man. This is known as the Adamic covenant, as many people call it, and brought in what many people call the dispensation of conscience. Adam and Eve has come to a personal knowledge of good and evil. Adam and Eve are now aware that they are naked. Genesis 3.10 And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid, because I was naked, and I hid myself. So they try to sew fig leaves together to make themselves clothes. And this pictures sinful man trying to cover his sin by his own works. Genesis 3.7 And the eyes of them both were open, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. So the Lord killed and shed the blood of an animal and covered them with the skin of the animal because, you know, they sew, sewing fig leaves together is not going to cut it. So the Lord has to shed the blood of an animal. And this pictures the Lamb of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, who would shed his blood for man to take away their sins. And that's why it says in Genesis 3.21, And unto Adam also, and to his wife, did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothe them. And we just assume it was a lamb. And that makes sense because that shows us the Lamb of God. The Lord requires a blood sacrifice at this time to temporarily give forgiveness for sins. And these blood sacrifices... These blood sacrifices wouldn't be able to get anyone to heaven with eternal life. It couldn't get rid of their sin. It could only get them into paradise in the heart of the earth where they would be until Jesus Christ shed his blood to permanently pay for their sin debt. Everybody who gets to heaven gets there because of the Lord Jesus. But you couldn't apply the blood of Jesus to Adam and Eve when Jesus hadn't shed his blood yet. So, there had to be a blood, bloody animal sacrifice to give temporary forgiveness until the perfect sacrifice the Lord Jesus Christ could come. And then, when Jesus Christ dies and sheds his blood on the cross, then that perfect sacrifice could be applied and that could get the people in paradise in the heart of the earth. That could get them to heaven. And since making themselves aprons represents works, and the blood of the animal sacrifice represented the blood of Jesus Christ, this gives a great picture of our salvation. 
we aren't saved by works, but rather by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Adam's faith and the bloody animal sacrifice for his sin is what made him safe and got him into paradise where he would stay until Jesus Christ shed his blood on the cross. Even Abel was aware that he needed to shed the blood of an animal to please God. Abel is the son of Adam. In Genesis 4, 2 through 5, it says, And she again bare his brother Abel. And Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel he also brought of the firstlings of his flock, and of the fat thereof, and the Lord had respect unto Abel unto his offering, but unto Cain unto his offering he had not respect, and Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. So once again you see Cain tried to please God with works when he brought the fruit of the ground. He's trying to impress God with his fruit. However, Abel brought the firstling of his flock and the fat thereof, so the Lord had respect for Abel's bloody animal sacrifice and not the works of Cain. The Lord's not impressed with your fruit. He wants to know, do you have the blood or do you not? But out of jealousy, Cain ends up murdering Abel. And he pictures a religious person trying to get to heaven by their works. And he's jealous of the man who is trusting in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, Cain and Abel had no idea who the Lord Jesus Christ was, and they wouldn't until Jesus Christ goes to the heart of the earth and tells them what he did on the cross and how he shed his blood. And that's when they would have went to the third heaven, after the Lord Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins. But it's interesting to see how, looking at Genesis 3.21, again, unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothe them. When the Lord made coats of skins to clothe Adam, some speculate that this could refer to the new fallen body that they received after the fall. Some speculate on that. It's interesting to see how the word clothed is used in the book of Job. In Job 10, 8 through 11, it says, it says, Thine hands have made me and fashioned me together round about, yet thou dost destroy me. Remember, I beseech thee, that thou hast made me as the clay, and what thou bring me into dust again. Hast thou not poured me out as milk and curdled me like cheese? Thou hast clothed me with skin and flesh, and hast fenced me with bones and and sinews. So, a lot of people speculate that when God makes coats of skins and clothes Adam and Eve, they speculate that this could refer to the new fallen body that they received after the fall. You know, it could be. I don't say that 100%. But as you know, Adam lost the image of God he lost both kingdoms. Therefore, all his sons are born in his image instead of the Lord's image. Genesis 5.3, it says, And Adam lived in 130 years and begat a son in his own likeness after his image and called his name Seth. So Adam and Eve, they've had Adam, or I mean, they've had Cain and Abel, and they now have Seth because Cain murdered Abel. So, when you were born, you weren't born a child of God. You weren't born a son of God. You were a child of the devil. You see, Seth in Genesis 5-3 is born in the image of Adam. He's not born in the image of God because Adam lost the image. And we're not born with the image of God. We're a child of the devil, a child of disobedience. Since Adam lost the image, we are all born sinners. We can't get the image of God back until we are born again, until we get saved. We can't get into the kingdom of God unless we are born again. You will notice that there are overlaps from the Adamic covenant that proceed even to the time we're living in today. For example, the ground is cursed, 
because of the sin of Adam and Eve. And that's still going on today. Women still labor in pain during childbirth. The man is still to be the head of the wife, even during this age we're in now. Uh, men still die and return to the ground, even in this age we're in now. So all the things that came about from the fall go on today. So Satan, in anger, goes after man. The kingdom was taken. He has messed up King Adam. So Adam and Eve are now sinners. Their children are born sinners. Sin gets so bad that God says, the thoughts of their heart is only evil continually. He says, my spirit shall not always strive with man for that he also is flesh. So the Lord makes the next move. He drowns out the earth. All except for one man and his family. And that man is Noah. But before we really get into Noah, on the next episode, we'll look at the sons of God and the state of the world during the days right up before the flood.